Puma Media's Polity Yamtabi Madiba. Joining me today is researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna, here to unpack his latest column titled, If We Want to Remedy Our Current Choiceless Democracy, We Must Re-Establish Link Between Politics and the People. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Is it not clear from your article whether you are counterposing popular politics to constitutional institutions like parliament? How do they really relate to one another? Yeah, I'm not suggesting that we must abolish political institutions like parliament or political parties. All I'm saying is that for the average person or the masses, uh, institutions like parliament and uh, institutions of government are not actually meeting their needs. They're not fixing up water. The water up here in Gauteng is so pollutant. There's already probably a lot of waterborne diseases and we don't know what to, to what extent there's cholera in the country. So there's a big danger of people People are already drinking the same water as animals are drinking and things like that. So there is a sense of alienation between the formal institutions under the constitution and the lives of ordinary people. So what I was doing in the article, I was saying, we have to restore a sense where people have some control over their own lives. And I didn't have strong answers on how to do that. I don't think the existing political parties are the answer and the number of popular organizations are very limited. There's Abakhali, Basim, John Dolo, there's Equal Education, there's this um, Makanda Citizens Front and a few others that I probably don't know about. So that they still have to be created But the Constitution is a victory. Uh, The Constitution and what people have gained under the Constitution is very important. Um, Just the other day, there was a wonderful court judgment in Cape Town about evictions. And it was just so humane. And the judiciary under apartheid in general, there were some exceptions, in general would never have made judgments like that, which empathize with the vulnerable and the poor. So I'm not suggesting we should do away with any institutions, including parliament, including the vote. All I'm saying is, if we have a sense that there's no one to vote for, then is that the end of the matter? Or can we not build other organizations on the basis of friendships that we have or associations that we belong to that may not be directly political. Some of them may be religious, some may be cultural, some organizations may need to be created and they can play a part in empowering people to deal with things in their own lives. As has happened, say, in Makanda, where they've got no functioning removal of refuse, they've got water pollution and a whole lot of other things. And instead of continuing to vote and feeling betrayed, they've established this front, which is standing for elections. Now, it's in my view possible that you can have that front, but also not stand for elections, but they've probably calculated that instead of leaving the resources in the hands of the existing political parties, specifically ANC, they must get those resources and make sure that they help the people. So I'm not suggesting one or the other, um, but I do come from a background in the United Democratic Front, among other things, where you had popular power and people took over a whole lot of things. And I think it's possible that that can happen. And when you advocate the popular, you do not really flood the reader with examples. So are you not able to provide more details? Well, you know, it's difficult to provide examples unless you already belong 
to some associations. Uh, for example, um, if I were a religious person and I went to church or synagogue or whatever it is, or mosque every week, I might be meeting with some people to discuss religious texts. And that would be a, a community that already exists. And the church, as well as mosques, and to some extent synagogues, have played some role in contributing towards uh, the defeat of apartheid. And they've, you know, they've been amazing uh, religious documents like the Kairos document and a number of others in the past. And I think uh, the present Pope, some of his statements could be used as a basis of dis for discussion in our own context, because he talks about uh, the environmental dangers, a whole lot of these things that are concerning people now. So I don't, I can't just say, well, here in Ikuruleni, you can do this and the other in uh, Tsakane, you know, they can do this and uh, uh, Timbisa, they can do that. Uh, I don't have, I don't have enough contacts. But what I'm trying to say is, you must look around you. There are acts of kindness, acts of generosity. You know, uh, a, a little child falls. There are a lot of strangers who will go and pick up the child. Or if a child's about to run into the traffic, people will stop that. Or if an old lady stumbles, people will help. Now, those acts of kindness are resources that we can draw on in building something new in South Africa. And, you know, it's vague, but it's for us to make it concrete wherever we are. Well, Raymond, is it correct to refer to the majority of people in South Africa as being oppressed? Is there not a big difference now compared with apartheid and with courts now overturning evictions in District 6, for example, and various other constitutional remedies? You know, there is a very big difference about the constitution that we have now. You know, I was trained in law, but I uh, spent a lot of my time breaking the law. Now, I broke the law because the constitution of the time was a constitution that oppressed people. Now, the constitution now has got amazing potential. The judge president of Gauteng, Dunson and Lumbo, the other day made a speech about the role that the judiciary can play in addressing social inequality. Now, that was not possible under the apartheid constitution. It is now possible under the constitution that we have. So that is very, very important. But in spite of this law, uh, the rights that people have under the constitution or to have their basic needs met. Now, millions have been spent on contracts where nothing has been delivered in terms of water, electricity, housing, roads, all these things. So that, and that's not um, in Santon. You know, I don't think there are potholes in Santon. Maybe I must go and inspect. I haven't been there for a very long time. But in the townships, you know, there's hardly any road. There's just these potholes every second yard. Now, this is not because funding has not been allocated for that or for uh, water taps. See, what often happens when they do provide things, they provide it and then they register the numbers and they say 100 more houses were electrified but they don't always provide uh, sustainable maintenance. If, for example, your water doesn't flow in one part of the Eastern Cape, the blockage, people have not been trained always, uh, usually in the area where they stay to clear the block blockage. They've got to wait for someone to come from Tsolo or some other place who, who will take two weeks. In the meantime, they don't have water or they don't have electricity, whatever it is. So that 
A, there is embezzlement of money. B, there is not planning in a way that makes it sustainable because many of the things that were provided after 1994 have collapsed, either because they were not properly planned or because they were not properly built. And that's the case with a lot of the RDP houses. So in, in so far as I am not, as a white, one of those who's, who is experiencing that, and it's mainly black people, by which I mean Africans, colors, and Indians, but primarily Africans amongst those, uh, they remain oppressed. We, we don't use the word oppressed, but it's, it is accurate to say they remain oppressed. If a policeman sees me, he will not usually uh, use a baton to get me to move along. But with black people, that happens. And I think it's that, that those are the signs of something that is familiar to anyone who was here under apartheid. And lastly, is it not a weakness of your article that you provide no guidelines for voting in the forthcoming elections? Well, you know, there are lots of people who are doing that. You know, it doesn't have to be me. I don't have, I don't have advice. And I leave that for the people who conduct polls and who, get, who guess and forecast. I'm not a fortune teller. All I can say, I can't advise any party people should vote for. You know, they must just, they must make their own choice. It's not my, uh, it's not within my competence given the qualities of the political parties today. So that's why I just kept quiet on that. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks a lot. That was Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to Prima Media's policy about if we want to remedy our current choiceless democracy, we must re-establish link between politics and the people.